It is said that yoga is an atheistic system. Do you agree with this? This is the question that was posed to Osho in his book, Yoga, the Alpha and the Omega, Volume 1, uh, the Patanjali series. So I'd like to pick up again where we left off with uh, the first podcast that we made about yoga and continue on a little bit deeper into Patanjali's Yoga Sutras. Uh, the first sutra is, uh, Patanjali says to us, now the discipline of yoga. So what does Patanjali mean by now? The word now is one of the most powerful words in the English language. Um, but it baffles many people because they don't understand what uh, the seeker is supposed to understand or, or, or mean by the word now. But I want to help you understand Patanjali's meaning of what he means by now the yoga sutras. To be in the state of now, to be in the present moment, to be, to be um, in a frame of mind where you're not thinking about other things in the future or desiring other things in, in some future that does not exist. Um, this is what Patanjali means by now. Or worried about things of the past and being pulled that way or, or in that direction too. Now means focus in this moment. And when you're completely focused in the present moment, the mind actually stops and there is no mind. And this is what Patanjali calls uh, yoga. Yoga means the union with the divine, the, the ultimate um, yoking, uh, bringing together uh, of you and, and God, and, or uh, let's call it God's existence. So I'm really ecstatic to bring you these words and to share these words. I read these uh, words over 10 years ago and they sunk in, but I've kind of, um, you know, forgotten the uh, dynamic uh, um, uh, meaning behind all these words. Anyway, let's go uh, into the uh, book, um, Yoga, the Alpha and the Omega, Volume 1. And on page 30, Osho says, again, yoga is neither atheistic or theistic. It is a simple science. It is neither theistic nor atheistic. Panjali, Patanjali is really superb, a miracle of a man. He never talks about God. And if, even if he mentions God once, then too he says that God is just one of the methods to reach the ultimate. That the belief in God is just a, a method to reach the ultimate. And there is no God. To believe in God is just a technique for him. Because through believing in God, prayer becomes possible. Through believing in God, surrender becomes possible. The significance of surrender and prayer, not of God. Patanjali is really unbelievable. He said that God, the belief in God, the concept of God, is also one of the methods among many methods to reach to the ultimate truth. Ishwar Pradinham. To believe in God is just a path, but it is not necessary. You can choose something else. Buddha reaches to the ultimate reality without believing in God. He chooses a different path where God is not needed. It is as if you have come to my house and you have passed through a certain street. But that street was not the real goal. It was just an instrumental. You could have reached the same house through some other street. Others have reached through other streets. On your street, there may be green trees, big trees, and on other streets, there are not. So God is just one path. Remember the distinction. God is not the goal. God is just one of the paths. Patanjali never denies. He never assumes. He is absolutely scientific. It is difficult for Christians to understand how Buddha could attain the ultimate truth because he never believed in God. And it is difficult for Hindus to believe that Mahavira could attain liberation because he never believed in God. Before Western thinkers became alert about Eastern religions, they always defined religion as God-centered. And when they came upon Eastern thinking, in which they became aware that, that there has been a traditional path reaching towards the truth, which is a godless path, they were shocked. For them it was impossible. H.G. Wells has written about Buddha, that Buddha is the most godless man, yet the most godly. He never believed, and he, never, and he would never tell anybody to believe in any god. Yet he himself is the supreme most phenomenon of the happening of a divine being. And Mahavira, too, uh, travels a path where God is not needed. 
Patanjali is absolutely scientific. He says we are not tied to means. There are a thousand and one means. The goal is the truth. Some have achieved it through God, so it is okay. Then believe in God and achieve the goal. Because the goal is achieved when you throw your belief. So belief is just instrumental. If you do not believe, it is also okay. Don't believe. Travel the path of belieflessness and reach the goal. Patanjali is neither theist nor atheist. He is not creating a religion. He has simply shown you all the paths that are possible and all the laws that work towards your transformation. God is one of those paths, but he is not a must. If you are godless, there, there is no need to be non-religious. Patanjali says that you can also reach. So be godless. Don't bother about God. These are the laws, and these are the experiments, and this is the meditation. Pass through it. He does not insist on any concept. It is very difficult to do this. That is why the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali are rare, unique. Such a book has never happened before, and there is no possibility of it ever happening again. Because what can be written about yoga, he has written. He has left nothing out. No one can add anything to it. There is no possibility in the future to create another work like Patanjali's Yoga Sutras. He has finished the job completely. And he could do this so totally because he was not partial. If he had been partial, he could not have done it totally or so totally. Buddha is partial. Mahavira is partial. Jesus is partial. Muhammad is partial. Each of them has a certain path, but their polarity or polarity may be because of you, because of deep concern for you, a deep compassion for you. They insist on a certain path. They go on insisting for their whole life. They say everything else is wrong and this is the right path just to create faith in you. You are so faithless. You are so filled with doubt that if they say that this path leads, but other paths also lead, you will not follow any path. So they insist that only this path leads. And this is not true. This is just a device for you because if you feel any uncertainty for the, in them, if they say this also leads, that also leads, this is also true, that is also true, you become uncertain. You are already uncertain. So you need someone that is absolutely certain. Just to look certain to, to you, they have pretended to be partial. But if you are partial, you cannot uh, cover the whole ground. Patanjali is not partial. He is less concerned with you and more concerned with the past uh, designings of the path. He will not use a lie. He will not use a device. He will not compromise with you. No scientist can compromise. Buddha can compromise. He has compassion. He is not treating you scientifically. He has such a deep human feeling for you that he can even lie just to help you. And you cannot understand the truth, so he compromises with you. But Patanjali will not compromise with you. Whatsoever is the, is the fact, he will talk about that fact. And he will not descend a single step to meet you. He is absolutely un uncompromising. Science has to be. Science cannot compromise. Otherwise, it would itself become a religion. And Patanjali is neither atheist or theist. He is neither Hindu or Mahidian, nor Christian nor Jain or Buddhist. He is absolutely a scientific seeker, just revealing whatsoever is the case. Revealing without any myth. He will not use a single parable. And Jesus will, will go on talking in stories because you are children and you can only understand stories. He will talk on, in parables and Buddha uses so many stories just to help you to attain a little glimpse. And I was reading a Hasid, a Jewish master, Baal Shem. He was a rabbi in a small village. And where, wherever, whenever there would be some, some trouble, some d disease, some calamity in the village, he would move into the forest. He would go to a certain spot under a certain tree. And there he would perform a ritual. And then he would pray to God. And it, and it always happened that the calamity would leave the village. 
The illness would disappear from the village. The trouble would go. Then Balshim died. He had a successor, and a problem came again. The village was in trouble. There was some calamity, and the villagers asked the successor, the new rabbi, to go to the forest and pray to God. The new rabbi was very much disturbed because he didn't know the right spot, the exact tree. He was acquainted with, unacquainted with it, but still he went under the, any old tree. He lit a fire, performed the ritual, and prayed and said to God, Look, I don't know the exact spot where my master used to go, but you know, you are omnipotent, you are omnipresent. So, if, so you know, and there is no need to look for the exact spot. My village is in some trouble. So listen and do something. The calamity was, was gone. Then when this rabbi died and his successor was there, again there was a problem. The village was undergoing a certain crisis. And again the villagers came and the rabbi was disturbed. He had even forgotten the prayer. He went into the forest and chose a place at random. He didn't know how to burn the ritual fire. But anyhow, he burned a fire and said to God, Listen, I don't know how to burn the ritual fire. I don't know the ex exact spot, and I have forgotten the prayer. But you are all-knowing, so you know already. There is no need, so do whatever is needed. And he came back to the village, and the village passed through the crisis. Then he also died, and he also had a successor. The village was again in trouble, so the people came to him. He was sitting in his armchair. He said, I don't want to go anywhere. Listen, God, you are everywhere. I don't know the prayer. I don't know any ritual, but that doesn't matter. My not knowing is not the point. You know everything. So what is the use of praying and what is the use of a ritual and what is the use of a particular spot? I know only the story of my successors. And I will tell you the story that this is what happened in Baal Shem's time. There was, and then there was his successor, then his successor. This is the story. Now do what is right, and it, and it will be enough. And the calamity disappeared. And it is said that God loved the story very much. People love their stories, and God loves them also. And through stories, you can have a certain glimpse. But Patanjali will not use a single parable. As I told you, he was Einstein plus Buddha, a very rare combination. He had an inner witnessing of a Buddha and the mechanism of the mind of Einstein. So he is neither theist or atheist. Theism is a story. Atheism is an anti-story. They are just myths. Man created parables to, to some one way appeals to some the other. Patanjali is not interested in any stories. He's not interested in any myths. He is interested in the naked truth. And he will not even clothe it. He will not even put on any dressing. He will not decorate it. That is not his way. Remember this. We will move on a very dry land, a desert land. But the desert land has a beauty of its own. It has no trees. It has no rivers. But it has a vastness of its own. No force can be compared to it. Forests have their own beauties. Hills have their own beauties. Rivers have their own beauties. The desert has its own vast infinity. And we will be moving through a desert land. Courage is needed. Patanjali will not give you a single tree to rest under. He will not give you any story, just the bare facts. He will not use even a single superfluous word. Hence the word sutra. Sutra means the basic minimum. A sutra is not even a complete sentence. It's just the essential. It's just like when you give a telegram and you go on cutting superfluous words. Then it becomes a sutra because only nine or ten words can be put into it. If you were going to write a letter, you would have filled ten pages. And even in ten pages, the message would not be complete. But in a telegram, in ten words, it is not only complete, it is more than complete. It hits the heart. The very essence is there. And these are telegrams. Patanjali Sutras, he is a miser. He will not use a single superfluous word. Then how can he tell stories? He cannot. So don't expect any. Then don't ask whether he is an theist or whether he is an atheist. These are just stories. Philosophers have created many stories, and it is a game. 
If you like the game of atheism, then be an atheist. If you like the game of theism, then be a theist. But these are games, not the reality. The reality is something else. Reality is concerned with you, not with what you believe. The reality is you, not what you believe. The reality is behind the mind, not in the contents of the mind. Theism is the content of the mind. Atheism is the content of the mind. There are something in the mind. Hinduism is a content of the mind. Christianity is a content of the mind. And Patanjali is concerned with the beyond, not with the content. He says, throw the whole mind. Whatsoever it contains is useless. You may be carrying it or be carrying beautiful philosophies, but Patanjali will say, throw them. It is all rubbish. It is difficult. If somebody says your Bible is rubbish, your Gita is rubbish, your scriptures are rubbish, rot, so throw them, you'll be shocked. But this is what is going to happen. Patanjali is not going to make any compromise with you. He is uncompromising. And that is the, his beauty. That is the beauty that is his ultimate uniqueness. So when Patanjali says to us, now the Yoga Sutras, he wants you to become a disciple, one who is ready to learn. Because disciple and discipline become from this they come from the same root and that means being being able to be open and, and receptive and ready to learn but listen to what a few more words of osho's um since we're talking about discipleship somebody asked him the question you talked about the significance of discipleship on the path of yoga how can an atheist be a disciple and osho responds to us by saying neither a theist nor an atheist can be a disciple they have already taken an attitude they have already decided. So what is the point of being a, dis a disciple? If you already know, how can you be a disciple? Discipleship means the realization that you do not know. Atheists, theists, know they cannot be disciples. If you believe in something, you will miss the beauty of discipleship. If you know something already, that knowing will give you the ego. It will not make you humble. And that is why pundits and scholars miss Sometimes sinners have reached, but scholars never. They know too much. They are, too, they are so clever. Their cleverness is their disease. It becomes a suicide. And they will not listen because they are not ready to learn. Discipleship simply means an attitude to learn, remaining aware moment to moment that you don't know. This knowing that you don't know, this awareness that you are ignorant, gives you an opening. Then you are not closed. The moment you say, I know, you, you are a closed circle. The door is no longer open. But when you say, I don't know, it means you are ready to learn. It means the door is open. So if you have already reached, concluded, you cannot be a disciple. One has to be in a receptive mode and one has to be continuously aware that the real is unknown and that whatsoever you know is trivial just rubbish. What do you know? You may have gathered much information, but that is not knowledge. You may have got accumulated much dust through universities, but that is not knowledge. You may know about Buddha, you may know about Jesus, but that is not knowledge. And unless you become a Buddha, there is no knowledge. Unless you are a Jesus, there is no knowledge. Knowledge comes through being, not through your memory. You can have a trained memory, but memory is just a mechanism. It will not give you a richer being. It may give you nightmarish um, dreams, but it will not give you a richer being. You will remain the same, covered with dust. Knowledge, and particularly the ego that comes through knowledge, the feeling that I know closes you. Now you cannot be a disciple. And if you cannot be a disciple, you cannot enter the disciple, uh, this, the discipline of yoga, excuse me. So come to the door of yoga, ignorant, aware of your ignorance, aware that you don't know. And I will tell you that this is the only knowledge which can help, the knowledge that I don't know. And this will make you humble. A subtle humil humility will come over you and the ego will by and by subside. Knowing that you don't know, how can you be egoistic? Knowledge is the most subtle food for the ego. You feel that you are something. You know, so you become somebody. All these thoughts um, about yoga have been given us by just 
one phrase, one Yoga Sutra, the beginning Yoga Sutra of Patanjali's 10 volumes uh, of uh, Yoga Sutras. And uh, it, just from the word now, you can read Osho's depths and understand uh, why, what it takes and what he means by you know, the word now again. I know we keep bringing it up, but it is most important to, you have to enter something in, with the right frame of mind and the frame of mind is, is an empty mind, uh, an, an empty space. It's like taking a, a, a glass uh, full of water and then emptying it and, and starting fresh and start and fill the cup with, with a, new, a new essence that you know nothing about, but you're open to it. You're open to taking in uh, that, you, that which you don't know. Anyway, thank you again. I know this um, has been 20 minutes of just talking about the word now and, and the first sutra in the uh, Patanjali's Yoga uh, Sutras, but uh, it, it'll, it'll help you along the way to understand you know, why you've done this and why you went and had to go through such arduous task of emptying the mind first before you uh, were able to study yoga. Thank you for joining me. Um, once again, my name is Douglas Grummans, and uh, it's been a pleasure talking to you. We'll continue on another time with more yoga sutras from Patanjali and Osho. I know it'll take an understanding soul and a, a brave soul also to uh, to follow me and uh, Osho on the depths of Patanjali's yoga sutras. So uh, good luck uh, to all, and I hope that um, you find the courage and the endurance to, uh, to follow us all the way through these yoga sutras. It'll be a blessing that... Uh, can be beyond, not compared to anything else. It'll be, be beyond all your other blessings. But um, anyway, I uh, just wanted to say thank you once again for joining me. Um, and we'll talk to you again sometime soon.